Sunday, May 21st, within the context of worship, uh, we will honor our graduates, uh, those from high school and from other <clears throat> educational institutions. Within the context of that worship, we will consider the scripture from Matthew chapter 18, um, generally looking at the whole chapter, but very specifically uh, focusing on uh, the first nine verses. Um, Sarah Hanks and I will each speak from this passage, um, taking different approaches uh, and addressing different uh, audiences, if you will. But for now, let's look at that passage uh, and uh, consider the basics of what Jesus seems to be uh, teaching here. In Matthew 18, beginning verse 1, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he, Jesus, called a child to himself and set him before them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks, for it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe to that man through whom the stumbling block comes. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away, for it is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than to have two hands or two feet and be cast into the eternal fire. If your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out and throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be cast into the fiery hell. We don't know because Matthew doesn't record the emotion or the uh, body language or the facial expression of the disciples, but it's safe to assume that they would have been shocked, surprised, maybe even stunned by this interaction between uh, them and Jesus. Uh, they had come asking him uh, about greatness, uh, but Jesus spoke only about God's little children. They had been thinking about all these great deeds and, and high positions, perhaps, in the kingdom. Uh, but Jesus, later in the chapter, from what we read, speaks about sheep and brothers and sisters in Christ and servants and being servants to one another. What did all this have to do with greatness? Well, a great deal. Uh, to be great in Jesus' present kingdom, he tells them, and the same applies to us, uh, we must, first of all, take our place as God's children. Uh, that is a matter of, of faith, accepting the salvation that we have through Jesus Christ uh, and believing not only in him, but committing ourselves to him with him being in the position of Lord, Master, Guide, Savior. Um, we first of all take our place then as God's children, and we learn to see our fellow believers uh, in the same way. They too are, while they are our brothers and sisters, they too are disciples. They too are fellow believers. Now, sometimes in our culture, and even that seeps into uh, church and seeps into those of us who make up church, um, in a desire to excel and a desire to stand out, um, we sometimes forget we're sheep. Uh, sheep are prone to go astray. Uh, they are always, always in need of the shepherd's care. We are counseled by Jesus in this chapter to remember that all other Christians, not just in our local church, not just in our denominations, not just in our region, 
are not just churches of people that look and sound and and think somewhat like we do, but we never forget that all other Christians are our sisters and brothers in Christ. And therefore, because they're family, we are to seek to live with them <clears throat> in complete unity, not always uh, unanimous with our opinions or our thoughts, but in unity because we all serve the same Christ. And then at the end of the chapter, Jesus is clear that we are to remember that we are simply servants living with fellow servants. We're not living over them and we're not living under them. We're living with them and we treat others with the same patience and forgiveness that we want them to treat us. But even more importantly, we treat others with the same patience and forgiveness that uh, Jesus shows us. So back to the to the scripture before us, more specifically, uh, the disciples come to Jesus with this question, who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And now, first of all, this says something very positive about the, the disciples in that they believed what Jesus had been teaching them, and that was that he was inaugurating his kingdom. Now, it's very clear through through many uh, different interactions recorded between Jesus and the disciples that they did not understand his kingdom. They didn't understand what his kingdom would be like. They did not understand what how he viewed his kingdom, even though he taught them. And near the end of the earthly ministry, you getting very clear on what his kingdom would be like, but they just never seemed to pick up on uh, what he was trying to teach them, at least not in any way in its entirety. Now, this question, who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven, uh, may have come out of the uh, recent, recent as in just before the question, the experience of Peter, James, and John on the Mount of Transfiguration. If you know that story, you know that those three went with Jesus up on the mountain. The other nine apostles being left behind in the village below. And then there was Peter's experience with the temple tax, uh, where Jesus um, miraculously uh, provided for this important uh, civic religious responsibility. And it could be, this is pure speculation, it could be that those other disciples may have thought that Jesus was playing favorites and, and so overlooking them. And this could have sparked their question in the context of the conversation. You can imagine one of them saying, well, now you've spent a lot of time with Peter, James, and John. Uh, you really spend a lot of time with Peter. What about us? Uh, are you telling us we're not as great as they are? We're not as good. We're not as important. We're not as valuable. Uh, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Uh, while we commend them for embracing the idea, Jesus had been teaching that he was bringing in his kingdom, uh, they did not understand the kingdom and, and seeking position and greatness, which seems to be what they were doing. And there are other sections of scripture that back up uh, their misinterpretation, misunderstanding, misrepresentation of a Christ kingdom. Uh, it, it is not a spiritual matter. It was not uh, Christ-like for them to be seeking a position and greatness over someone else. So in answer to their question, uh, Jesus uses an object lesson. Uh, we often use objects less, object lessons, especially with children, uh, knowing that they their thinking may not be as uh, able to be as deep as we hope adults or as they're not able to understand necessarily some of the uh, more nuanced uh, explanations for deep issues and or heavy questions, uh, an object lesson can be useful. Uh, perhaps that gives us some indication of how Jesus viewed the disciples at this point. Uh, that he would use an object lesson to teach them. Uh, in answer to the question then, uh, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Uh, Jesus uh, calls a child to himself and set him before them. 
Uh, so we get the idea here that this is probably an informal setting, likely in someone's home, perhaps Peter's. Some have even suggested, and of course, this is pure speculation that this was one of Peter's children. Uh, again, the child is not identified, so that is strictly uh, speculation. But this child is Jesus' illustration of greatness. Here we see the honor of greatness connected strongly with humility. Uh, as one writer said, we must go down before God will lift us up. Uh, Peter writes this, 1 Peter chapter 5, Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. That last section, uh, a quote from uh, Proverbs chapter 3. But Peter speaking to young and old, uh, while giving the, the young instruction to follow the older ones, the elders, uh, not just chronological age here, but those who are stronger, deeper, uh, older in the faith, more mature in the faith, but saying to all of them, young and old, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. Think about the people that you have known or perhaps you have read about in Christian history. Uh, think of those that uh, might be um, labeled as, as great saints, and we can talk about what that means some other time, but we sometimes look at a person, either someone we know in contemporary culture, or we read about someone and say, oh, that, that person is was so godly, so saintly. And if you dig into that person's life, if truly they are living that saintly life, then you will find very quickly true humility uh, in that person's life. Uh, not a sense that they that they that they have low self worth or they don't see themselves as valuable. Rather, they know they are very valuable in God's sight. Uh, they are worth God sending Jesus uh, for to secure their salvation. But they don't have a high view of themselves in relation to other people. They are uh, willing to learn from others, willing to serve others, willing to get along with others, even though they may be uh, the smartest. A Bible scholar in the room. They may be the deepest, uh, mature, most mature believer in the group, yet they still value and hold up for honor and esteem uh, the others. So great saints are, are humble saints. Uh, now, Jesus holds up a child. The children aren't sinless. They're not perfect, but they do have characteristics uh, that we see in believers' lives, uh, those believers who are uh, growing steadily in their faith, growing deeper in their commitment and in their understanding of the things of Christ. Uh, children are teachable, generally. Uh, they usually know they don't know. Uh, they don't necessarily know what, know what they don't know, but they know. We don't know everything. So they're willing to be taught by a parent or another adult. They tend to be simple in their wants. Uh, you think about a young child, uh, they want food, uh, they want uh, shelter, uh, they want uh, the opportunity for rest, uh, and they want love and legitimate affection. Uh, pretty simple, and, and they are focused on those things. They're not worried about 401ks, <coughs> <laughs> or necessarily having bigger and better homes or uh, some of the things that adults tend to pursue in their lives. They're simple in their wants. Uh, they have expectant attitudes uh, as they look toward uh, the parents and other significant adults in their lives, expecting that those people will be the ones providing for those simple wants. And they're dependent on those people. And there generally is not any uh, sense of shame or any hesitation to be dependent. Sometimes as adults, we are so independent uh, that we push away people that can truly help us and truly would want to help us. So 
these characteristics of children are recommended or um, put forward uh, by Jesus bringing this child in before these disciples, these, these men who've been following him around for a while. Uh, and yet it is a child that he holds up and says, the, this child represents uh, the people who are greatest in the kingdom. Now, of course, the only way to become a child in the kingdom uh, is to be born again. Jesus teaches that to Nicodemus as it's recorded in John chapter 3. Uh, so Jesus just holds us up and says, you've got to be, you've got to become, you've got to humble yourself. You've got to become dependent. Uh, you've got to uh, simplify your needs to focus only on the things that are truly important. Uh, the, the food and the drink for the spirit uh, that comes through this relationship with Jesus Christ and uh, truly depend on uh, your heavenly father uh, to meet your needs. Then he moves on and the, the, the teaching or the lesson here uh, gets fairly heavy and some might even say uh, dark. Um, he says in beginning in verse uh, five, uh, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. So uh, making it very clear uh, that our task uh, is to be open to anyone uh, who is a fellow follower of Jesus. Uh, if you receive them, Jesus says, you receive me for they uh, come in Jesus name. And Jesus, through the work of the Holy Spirit, is living in them. And so we welcome them. We embrace them uh, in uh, the name of, of Jesus Christ. So by talking about these little ones, as he does in, in verse 10, um, Jesus means not only uh, children, like this child that he set before them, but the children of God, who uh, we find in other parts of the New Testament, are God's little children. In 1 John, we, we see that phrase uh, again and again. Now, Jesus warns here uh, that it is possible, not only possible, it, it, it happens uh, that these children, these little ones that have come to Christ, have started this faith journey. Uh, and we're not just talking about uh, those that are young in chronological age, but those that are young spiritually, they've just started their journey of faith. Uh, Jesus says that sometimes they stumble, sometimes they spiritually trip up. Uh, and he acknowledges that uh, it, it's, a, it's a tragedy, he says. But even more tragic uh, is the person through whom that stumbling block appears. Uh, someone, I'm going to find that, uh, got a quote here I want to share with you. Uh, no one, and I don't remember where I picked this up, no one sins uninvited. But Jesus says, woe to a person who invites another person to sin. So if our, um, and he's still speaking of stumbling, he, he talks about the little ones who stumble and woe to the one who causes the little one to stumble. But then he turns back to the individual and says, uh, if you, uh, if you stumble uh, because uh, of your hand or your foot or your uh, your eyes, uh, then get rid of whatever it is, whatever instrument it was through whom or through which that stumbling came. Uh, in other words, he says, if, you're, if your hand causes you to, uh, to stumble, if your foot causes you to stumble, then cut it off, he says, and throw it away. Now, obviously, Jesus was speaking in hyperbole here, uh, because the truth is that uh, as we learn the biblical um, explanation, understanding of sin, and Jesus has said this elsewhere, that 
the sin comes from the heart. Uh, the hand uh, may sin or may cause the sin, but it is because of the prompting of the heart. Sin begins in the heart, as does obedience. Uh, so we could get rid of our hands and our feet, uh, and our spiritual center uh, can still be dark and can still be pumping out the energy uh, for sin. Now, just as sin comes from our spiritual center, so does obedience. And so it is the obedience from our spiritual center that keeps our hands uh, away from sin, that keeps our feet away from sin. What Jesus is telling us here, speaking quite bluntly and dramatically, that Jesus is telling us to deal with our sins drastically, deal with them completely, and deal with them mercilessly. Same way a surgeon might deal with a, or would deal with a cancerous growth. Cut it out. Get rid of it. Even if sometimes there is damage done to the surrounding tissue, or even if the, the patient uh, may take uh, a great deal of time to recover uh, from the surgery. Uh, better to uh, inflict temporary uh, damage uh, than to uh, allow that uh, diseased uh, part uh, to continue to uh, work its negative work on the physical body. Here's how one writer said it. We must not play with sin or delay getting rid of it. We must face our sins honestly, confess, and forsake them. Uh, let's, let's stop there. That's heavy enough for this week and uh, will give us plenty of things to think and uh, mull over as we work our way toward uh, Sunday. I'm especially grateful for the work of uh, Warren Weirs Weirsby uh, as well as Ello Richards. Uh, two of the uh, writers that I've read to help give me some more clear focus on this uh, passage. I'm always indebted to those that uh, have the tools and the uh, calling uh, to help uh, open up Scripture uh, for all of us to better understand. Uh, I'm doing this uh, recording a little bit earlier than usual uh, to allow me some flexibility during the week, uh, flexibility of schedule. Uh, so for our, our prayer sheet has not been updated just yet. Uh, so for the most updated uh, prayer list, uh, go to our website. You'll find it there. If you've never done that before, you'll need to contact the church office uh, and get the login information. We do keep that behind a uh, a lock and key, if you will, uh, for the privacy of those whose names are on there so that that's not out just in the in the general um, information. Uh, look forward to joining with you uh, this uh, Sunday as we come together to worship. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of our um, time together today, uh, we will be uh, honoring our graduates. And if you know of a graduate uh, that uh, or someone who's graduating this year from high school or from uh, some uh, advanced work beyond high school, make sure that we know about it. Uh, call the office or uh, email uh, Kelly or Sarah. They're putting together this part of our worship time. Uh, even if you think, oh, well, surely somebody else has told them better that we hear about it twice than uh, or about someone twice, then not at all. So if you'll help us identify and locate all of those that are graduating so we can appropriately honor them this week. Look forward to seeing you as we come together to worship on May 21.